Blog Talk Radio. I 
back, you just heard Whitechapel from their CD, Our Endless War. The name of the song is The Saw is the Law. And we opened that set up with Aeon from Aeon's Black. The name of the song was I Wish You Death. In about 18 minutes, we're going to have our feature interview with director, writer, and producer Dustin Wade Mills. But before that, it's time for some digital dismemberment. Digital Dismemberment. And in our first digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening, we are going to be covering Scream Factory's release of The Tomb of Lygia from the Vincent Price Collection 2. A little bit of background information. Some years after having buried his beloved wife Lygia, Verdon Fell meets and, and eventually marries the lovely Lady Rowena. Fell is something of a re- recluse, living in a small part of a now ruined abbey with his manservant Kenrick as his only other occupant. He remains infatuated with his late wife and is convinced that she will return to him. While all goes well when first married, he returns to his odd behavior when they return to the abbey from their honeymoon. The memories of Lygia continue to haunt him as well as her promise that she would never die. Once again, this is from the second Vincent Price collection from Scream Factory. Uh, the other f- film that actually accompanies the Tomb of Lygia on that disc is The Last Man on Earth. The entire set includes The Raven, The Comedy of Terrors, of course The Tomb of Lygia, and The Last Man on Earth, Dr. Fives Rises Again, the, Ret- and, uh, the Return of the Fly, and House on Haunted Hill. And once again, you know, Vincent Price, I mean, how, how can you go wrong? This is definitely a, a classic, and of course he is in the role of Verdon Fells. And he's kind of an odd gentleman who has an affliction to bright sunlight, for one, and, and wears some actually pretty gangster glasses in this movie. And it's, it's really amazing to see how, how young he looked. And there's an interesting side note to that, actually, Vincent was not the original selection to play the role. Roger Corman had initially wanted to uh, use Richard Chamberlain in the role because he was worried that Vincent Price was too old for a character who was supposed to be between 25 and 30 years old. Um, AIP wanted Price in the film, and that was a condition of them investing in the film. So... You know, I found that to be to be really interesting, and I was doing a little bit more research on the film, and it turns out that uh, Roger Corman gave Vincent Price a wig and used more makeup on him to make him look younger than he actually was. So, you know, I always found that to be a little interesting uh, background about the film. When the film first opens up, uh, just like in the first Vincent Price box set, uh, there is an introduction to this particular film that was part of the Vincent Price Gothic Horrors, which was a 12-part film series broadcast on Iowa Public Television in 1982. So when the film comes in, Vincent talks about the film a little bit, and then when the film ends, he you know he talks a little bit more about the film and what's coming up next. You know, very beautifully presented. Uh, One of the other special features for this, or two of them actually, is there's a still gallery of photos from the film, and we have the trailer for the film as well. It's kind of an odd film. Uh, You know, there's suggestions of hypnosis, possibly possession. There's a few things that go on in the film. If if you've never read the story from Poe, you know, kind of makes you question what's going on. The character of Verdon Fells is, again, like I said, a, kind of a strange gentleman. He recreates wax versions of treasures from tombs because he does not believe in disturbing the tombs. There's a lot of Egyptian artifacts and things like that that you see during the film. It's kind of interesting, too, that uh, Elizabeth Shepard, who plays uh, Lady Rowena, it's kind of odd how they meet and how she kind of falls for him right away. 
But there, uh, going back to the hypnotism part, it, it would appear that uh, Lygia almost hypnotized Burton into keeping her body. Um, and then there's the part with the cat. The cat seems to show up in weird places and, and, and wreaks havoc not only on Burton, but also Lady Rowena. Uh, the cat's responsible for her falling off of her horse near Lygia's grave. The cat later scratches her face and basically torments her throughout the film almost to run her off as if the cat is the physical embodiment of Lygia. And as the film goes on, you continue to see more and more of, of Verdon's strange behavior, him going for long walks by himself. And a lot of it seems to be tied to the Abbey itself. When he and Lady Rowena leave uh, on their honeymoon, he seems quite normal. There doesn't seem to be any problems. But when he comes back, his weird psychosis has start to happen again. And again, elements of the supernatural were really brought into focus when he hypnotizes Rowena in front of dinner guests one night. And it seems as though she basically takes over Rowena's body. You know, again, a- another classic tragic Poe tale is at the end, you know, he battles, you know, Verdon battles his demons, uh, you know, the cat claws his eyes out, there's a huge fight, and all the way at the end of the film, even though you see him throw her body into a fire pit, uh, as the house burns down and collapses around Verdon, he is laying in the arms of Lygia as Lady Rowena leaves in a carriage. So, you know, very striking, very colorful film. The costumes are absolutely amazing. The set pieces are amazing. Um, a lot of people ask about the quality of the film. Um, there's, it's not a pristine mint condition, you know, considering the fact that how old the film is. However, it is an amazing looking film. The colors are very rich. You only get a few minor flecks um, and scratches. Really does not her from the overall look of the film. There's uh, one scene in particular with the candles at the dinner scene um, where Lady Rowena is pouring wax over her food, and the blues in that are just absolutely stunning. And of course, the character acting is, is fantastic. Follows along with Poe pretty well in the story. Um, the film, of course, is a 1080p transfer, uh, 2.3, 4.1. Like I said, really worth checking out. As, as an, I mean, as, as, as a rating for the film, I would give the film a 3 out of 5. It's not my favorite Poe film or Vincent Price film, but it is definitely a film I remember from my childhood and enjoyed immensely in a VHS box set that my parents had got me for Christmas one year. <coughs> as an overall package, <coughs> excuse me, you have to give this a 10 out of 10 with everything that Scream Factory put into this box set, including the nice collector's booklet that has uh, a lot of posters and still shots that you normally wouldn't see anywhere else. I would definitely recommend you head on over to Scream and Shout Factory to order this from them. You should be able to order it on eBay. If you're lucky, you can find it in your big box retailers. But this is definitely a collection worth picking up, and over the next couple of months, we will be covering the rest of the films that have not been covered yet, both on this release and the original Vincent Price box set from Scream Factory. Coming up in about 10 minutes, we're going to go into our feature interview with director, writer, and producer, Dustin Wade Mills. But before that, we're going to do some world podcast premiere music. This is the brand new Visigoth from the CD, The Revenant King. The name of the song is The Dungeon Master. Yeah, I think so. 
heard a double shot of world podcast exclusive music from Visigoth from their brand new CD, The Revenant King. You just heard Necropolis. And before that, we open that set up with Dungeon Master. But now it's that time in the show for our feature interview. And tonight, we've got a young man on who, in my opinion, is someone that everyone needs to be watching and taking notice of. I am, of course, talking about director, writer, and producer, Dustin Wade Mills. Dustin, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course, man. Thank you you for the ring introduction. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know, it's... I've had a chance to check out some of your work, and um, I would be remiss. He would be mad at me if I didn't say anything. Um, Of course, Matt Brewer over at Horse Society has reviewed just about all of your your films, and he wanted me – apparently you two know each other at least decently. He wanted me to to ask you when you were going to hook up with him, but you know how Mac is. So just felt like I had to say that to get him off my back. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean – We'll get into everything in a minute, but how you been, man? I mean, you are probably the busiest man going right now when it comes to the micro-indie horror genre. Kind of tell everyone about who you are and how you got into it. Um, I'm just a dude from Indiana. I grew up in a small town in Indiana. Uh, I kind of always wanted to make movies. Um, I started fooling around with, like, cameras and special effects and, and stuff like that when I was 12. We got a little VHSC uh, camera. It was actually my mom's, but I confiscated it and started making movies with my G.I. Joes and stuff like that. And uh, just, I just always wanted to make movies. And then, um, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I guess it's been about five years now, I sort of just decided, um, I actually had a basically like a, a mental breakdown and sort of decided that I needed to try and make a movie, and that's when I made Puppet Monster Massacre, which is my first movie. And uh, I've just been kind of going ever since then. I'm kind of only only happy, only satisfied if I'm, if I'm telling stories and putting them out there. So I just try to do it as often as I can and experiment a lot and learn as much as I can as I go. Now, you brought up the Puppet Monster Massacre, and, and I'll say the same thing I say every show. You know, the majority of the dates and everything that I'm getting are off IMDb, so if something is not right, please feel free to tell me and, and we'll get the okay. info right. But you started with the Puppet Monster Massacre, and one of the things uh, that seems to be a common thread in your film, at least in, in several of your projects, is the use of puppets. Now, were puppets always something that you had an interest in, and what brought the Puppet Monster Massacre to the screen? Um, I mean, uh, kind of like I've always liked, you know, the stuff that Jim Henson did. I always thought puppets and stop motion and just creature effects in general were really interesting. And uh, I've always preferred that kind of stuff when it comes to creating monsters um, to CGI. I mean, wonderful things can be done with CGI, but, you know, so often I just think a, a guy in a suit or a, or a puppet or an animatronic um, is just more interesting to me, you know, to see on the screen. So um, I had no prior <laughs> puppeteering experience or anything like that. Um, I'm not a puppet person. I don't have, like, a closet full of puppets that I talk to or anything like that. Uh, it just, you know, it kind of seemed like a cool thing to do. I really hadn't seen anybody do it. The closest that, that I'd ever seen was uh, Meet the Feebles by Peter Jackson, and that's oh, been yeah. quite a fun horror movie. It's more of like a sleazy exploitation kind of thing. So uh, I just wanted to take a crack at something. Um, I knew that I, you know, I didn't have to have uh, actors and um, didn't have to worry about scheduling as much and stuff like that. So and, and it helped me learn a lot about puppeteering and puppet building and chroma keying and digital effects and all that stuff. So that's kind of why it was my, my first movie. Now, you know, you voiced several of the uh, of the characters in the film. And, but one of the things that's really striking about it when you first see the film is is just the quality of it. You know, for a first especially for a first time film director, you know, kind of talk about what the public and critical response was to the film and were you surprised mm-hmm. about how much how much press, how much how much it still gets talked about today? Uh, yeah, it was it was kind of shocking. Um, 
there's actually a video somewhere of me and my wife took it of uh, when it first, like, when we put the teaser trailer up, it got picked up by one of the bigger horror sites, and then it got a ton and ton of views, and I was just elated, you know, and I had no idea. So it's pretty cool. I mean, um, it's neat that it seems like more people than I would ever guess kind of know that it exists. But surprisingly enough, it wasn't like a financially successful film. Like it wasn't a hit for me or, or anything like that. I mean, um, it maybe has just now made its like three thousand dollar budget back, uh, you know, <laughs> just recently. So um, I mean, it's neat that that people were kind of interested in it, but it wasn't exactly a you know a blockbuster. But I'm glad that it w- it was sort of the first brick, you know, in in the house that I've built so far in the the uh the fan you know the fan base that I've developed and and stuff like that. So I mean it opened doors and it kind of it allowed me to prove to myself that I could do something like that. And uh so you know it's important obviously in my my filmmaking career. Def- definitely. Now your next film which was 2 years later and again this is IMDb was Zombie A-hole and that was the first film that I saw the draw that drew you to my attention, being a huge zombie movie fan, you know, in and of itself. You know, it, <laughs> I love it that when you look on IMDb, one of the uh, the plot keywords for the film is uh, shaved vagina. So, I, you know, <laughs> it's it's just one of those things that really draws your attention. And, you know, and, and I, I really, I really enjoyed uh, the character of the religious cowboy in the film, you know. And, and this one, you know, had a had a about a thirty minutes longer running time than um, your previous film. You know, kind of talk about, and it's very bloody, which of course I like. You know, being an effects artist myself, you know, kind of talk about where the concept for zombie a hole came from. And when you moved into this, you know, you went of course live action. Can you talk about kind of the challenges you had going from working with puppets to working with actors and actresses in front of the camera? Um, yeah, that one, it was actually um, Brandon, who you know, who plays the, the titular character in the film, uh, Brandon Salkill, who's in a ton of my movies. He's kind of my partner in crime. And uh, he and I just came up with the idea for this uh, movie that in its early stages, was just kind of a slasher movie, and we thought we were going to shoot it in, like, a couple of weekends or something, and it ended up taking us nine months to shoot the entire thing. And uh, it's, I don't know, all of our stuff tends to, like, snowball like that. Like, I can't just be satisfied having something simple. I have to build some big, ludicrous mythology behind all of it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It kind of was born from that, and it became its own thing, and uh there's actually the 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 cut that the runtime is listed on IMDb as the original cut there's a director's cut out there too which is actually shorter and I think is better paced but uh that was interesting uh working with live actors is actually easier in a lot of ways than working with puppets as long as you can get scheduling to work the 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 only literally the only part of the filmmaking process that I dislike is scheduling it is the worst it's just, it's just fucking horrible, and I hate it. <laughs> and it's, the, it's the bane of my existence. So, uh, other than that, working with uh, live actors is awesome because I don't have to do everything. You know, in Pup Monster Master, I puppeteered all the puppets by myself. So, you know, it's kind of cool to not have to do every single thing. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely understand that. Um you know, one of the things I was in doing my research to, to have you on the show, I had read several other interviews that you had done, and one of the things that you had mentioned in one of your interviews was you were kind of tired of the, of you know, the standard zombie, oh, just a bullet to the head puts him down kind of thing. You know, what did you try to bring to the film in your mind that would set it apart from just the everyday standard zombie film? Um. I think it's different in its execution. I don't think it really plays out like a zombie film. I'm always hesitant to even call it a zombie film. It's more like a horror action adventure movie or something. Um, I don't know. I think what what I actually get tired of in in the horror genre, and especially in, in the indie realm, is uh, 
a lot of filmmakers, and, and I'm not trying to disparage anybody because some of these actually turn out pretty good, but a lot of filmmakers tend to just make lower budget remakes of movies that they like. You know, they just sort of tread the same path and do the same thing. You see a lot of very similar slashers, a lot of very similar zombie movies, and um, I just I think that it's kind of our privilege and duty as as indie filmmakers and especially like underground low budget filmmakers where there's literally nobody to tell us what to do. It's kind of our duty and privilege to just get really fucking weird and try things that <laughs> that maybe won't even work, you know, like sometimes you have to fail to learn and uh I I feel like maybe there's not enough of that going on or if it is going on it doesn't get appreciated enough as it as it should. Right. No, I, I would certainly uh, agree with you on that. Um, you know, I, I've worked on a couple, you know, low micro budget zombie films myself, and and I feel the same way about it. You know, it's I want to see something different. I, I want to see something done, and it's it's nice to see that you know you're taking that vision to a whole other level. Yeah. Now, thank you. Your next film, and you know, again, this was one that 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 got a lot of buzz and. I could be wrong about this, but I think this was the first one that you that you really put out, you know, on on HD, was Night of the Tentacles, and um, I just there's something about that the story that I like, and it and it reminds me of, uh, in in a lot of ways it reminds me of, of Night of the Creeps in terms of how you presented it and how it comes across on film, um, very bloody, you know, a lot of sex. You know, and the question is: Is will Delia ever finish urinating? But you know, it's it's it just there was something about that film. I, I can't. There's no way I can really articulate it. But it, it was just it was a fun film, and you know, you have you have not only the great practical effects, but you brought in um, a lot. You know, there's a decent amount of of CG involved as well. You know, again, for someone who was on their third film, when you look at it, the film has such a polished look and and quality about it. You know, the dialogue in the film is great. You know, I, I thought the actors were great. There's 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 just so much about this film to like. You know, what was your inspiration in particular for Night of the Tentacles? And, you know, with each film, like I said, you know, you kind of ramp up your gore and, and your nudity. You know, kind of talk about as a director how you your your actors seem so very comfortable doing all of the things that they do in your films. Kind of talk about how you talk to your actors about what you wanted in this particular film. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I anytime it comes to um, and thank you by the way for your kind words, but uh, <laughs> when it when it comes down to uh sex scenes and, and nudity and stuff like that, uh, I just, you know, I don't really have to do any coercion. Uh, you know, there's, I don't talk people into it. Um, it's just kind of, I, I present the script and when I'm talking to them about their part, I'm like, you know, and there's this, there's, you know, full frontal nudity or there's a sex scene or there's a masturbation scene or whatever, you know, are you comfortable with that? And, you know, and then we, and then we talk about it and I don't know. I mean, I've just never had a problem. Nine times out of ten, people are just like, oh, that's fine. I don't care. And we just kind of do it. And, I mean, I, I I don't think there's any really any real trick to it except for maybe just not being a creep, <laughs> you know. So, right. Um, but, you know, that one, I think that one has less nudity than uh, Zombie A-Hole, but it, has, it definitely has more sex. But uh, I don't even remember the impetus behind that movie. But that is one of my more personal scripts. Um, that one and, and Skinless, which just came out, are movies that are very personal to me and they're very personal stories. And um, to me, they're uh, they're about different stages in my life and how I had to grow grow up and and, and alter my worldview to be a better person and and things like that. So th- those two scripts, especially, are very personal to me. And Night of the Tentacles was the first really personal thing I'd ever written. And it seemed to resonate with people. I wasn't sure if people would like it because it's so dialogue heavy, but um, it's it's definitely a fan favorite. People really dig that one. Now, your next film, you kind of tore something out of the headlines, and and again, this was another film. When I saw that you were doing it, I was like, wow, this you know, 
this guy's got his fingers on the pulse of what's going on. And, of course, I'm talking about bath salt zombies. Yeah. And, you know, for anyone who lived under a rock, of course, you know, we had the bath salt incident in Florida where the naked man, you know, bit the guy's face off and, and everything <laughs> that went on with that. You know, yeah. was that your inspiration for the film? And, again, you know, incredible effects work, great story, great dialogue. You know, how did you take – a real life, you know, of course the guy wasn't a real zombie, but, you know, kind of talk about how you took that real life element and turned that into, as far as I've been able to tell, was the first film to tackle bath salt in any kind of fashion. Um, that one's kind of interesting because uh, basically two days after that incident in Florida had happened, people kept throwing around the term zombie, like, oh, he's a zombie, he's a bath salt zombie. So, um, again, Brandon and I were like, oh, we should make a movie about that. So we went we in my apartment, and then in the woods we filmed this movie that I haven't released. Before <laughs> before we finished it and I released it, I was contacted by uh, Clint Weiler, the producer from MVD, and he was like, hey, man, I want to make a Bath Falls movie. Can you do that? And I was like, well, I kind of already shot one, so <laughs> if you want that one, you can have it. And he was like, he's like, no, 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 I got my own story that I want to do. So he sent me an outline, and I kind of built a script around the outline, and we shot it. And uh, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of what it was. My weird, but the weird thing for me was that, you know, I had to write this movie about drug dealers and junkies and stuff, and like I had know nothing about drugs, you know, like I I you know smoked weed a couple times in my life. Other than that, I had no clue. So I just had to write this goofy movie about drugs with absolutely zero knowledge about how that world works or anything like that. So I just turned it into a big comedy and made everybody kind of a dumbass because, I mean, I felt like a dumbass when I was writing it, trying to, you know, I was like, I had, you know, no insight to that world whatsoever. So, but it was a fun way to try out some, go ahead. No, I was going to say what was unique about that though is, is when you look at it, you don't you don't get that impression. I mean, it's not to say that oh my God, you know this guy knows his drugs, he knows what's going, you know. But but you, the way that it was written, the way that it was done, you you definitely convey that message. And one of the things I really wanted to ask you was, you know, again talking about the effects work, the practical work, you know, some of the digital work. You know how. How have you managed – one of my biggest complaints about film, whether it's indie film or major film, is the overuse of digital effects. And it seems like you have just – you've managed to find a way to find that perfect balance to where it's not a distraction. It doesn't take away from you watching the film. You know, how did, how did you manage to incorporate your digital work in with your practical work? Well, I mean, my my kind of theory on uh, on every movie that I make is that if we can do it, if we can afford it, and it's within our our means and abilities to do it practically, then I want to do it practically. But if we can't, sure. then we do it then we do it digitally, and that's how every effect is approached. And then sometimes, you know, it's both things. Sometimes we build a puppet, but we make its eyes blink or its mouth move digitally. But there's a real puppet there, and zombie a hole. There's that little zombie in the in the tiny little box or whatever. That was a real puppet that was on set, but his face was manipulated digitally to make him talk and his eyes blink and all that stuff. And that works 100% better, in my opinion, than just doing it completely digitally. You know, uh, right. so you know, it's a, it's kind of about that. And then it's about when you're doing special effects. Uh, I think when you're the director, editor, and effects person. Um, you you kind of have the advantage of you know what you can get away with, and a lot of it is just like smoke and mirrors, you know, editing tricks, things like that. You know, you're just basically doing magic tricks uh, to sure. show an effect, you know, hiding the seams or hiding the cuts. You know, we do a lot of we hide cuts by passing behind objects or you know by whip panning and stuff like that. Where you know there's a scene in Snuff It, um, one of my newer movies that came out in 2014 where there's a home invasion where, you know, uh, Brandon's character, Helmet, comes in and he kidnaps these two puppet kids. And uh, there's three puppets in the scene, and we had to uh, hide the puppeteers. And so even though it looks like one long take, it's actually it's somewhere between 15 and 20 different shots that are all stitched together to hide puppeteers and, 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 and things like that and digitally remove puppeteers and, 
and stuff like that. So I think I have that advantage of, you know, I'm, I, I don't have to consult with anybody or, or, you know, sit down and have a brainstorming session. I just know what will work because I'm the one who's going to have to do it. Right. It's, you know, and, and we'll get back to your films in a second, but, you know, you, you kind of brought up something I, I wanted to talk about, and that's the fact that you wear so many hats, you know, director, writer, actor, editor, producer, cinema photographer, you know, visual effects, special effects, camera department, composer, you know, just, just all of these things. And, you know, when you first thought about getting into film, you know, were you, was it always your intention to do all of that yourself? And once you got into it and you started doing all of that, you know, kind of talk about your process when you're having to do all of those things. Um, I mean, it was never my intention to do that. I, you know, I thought when I was a kid that I was going to grow up and go to, you know, uh, Hollywood and I would have a team of people and, you know, my job as director would just be telling those people what to do. But, you know, that was just wasn't the reality. And that's the reason I came to the conclusion, you know, that I just needed to do all this stuff myself is just that, I mean, you just can't rely on people. It's really hard to find people that you can rely on, especially when you're either, you know, paying them very little or only paying them in pizza, you know. Uh, right. It's hard to get people to show up and, and do hard work. And so it just became easier for me to do it all myself. And to be honest, like, that's the way I – that's the way I like to do it. That's the way I feel comfortable. I like all of those things. I like to edit. I like to do the effects. I like to, you know – to run the camera and do the lighting and all that stuff. Like I enjoy every aspect of it. And so I think it, you know, it would be very, very hard for me to hand some of those duties over, you know, and, um, uh, Hornet's Sting and the Hell It's Cause was the first movie where I had another cameraman, you know, and I kind of had to, you know, swallow my pride and hand a camera off, you know, so that we could run three cameras at a time. And, um, you know, and coming up on, uh, her name was Torment Two. I have Marcus Cook doing uh, special effects. We're actually both handling effects, but the the brunt of it will be Marcus. And so that's been like a massive, um, you know, I mean, it's a, it's totally amazing. I'm so excited to work with him, but it, it was a little bit of, you know, trepidation for me. It's like, oh, I'm going to hand this off to somebody else. But luckily it's Marcus who I trust completely and implicitly, and I know he'll do amazing work. So I guess as I go no. on, I've been kind of, handing jobs off, but it, in the beginning it was just because I couldn't rely on anyone. Now, of course, uh, you know, I expect directing and writing would probably be your answer to this, but, you know, aside from those two, with all of those things, out of out of all the things that you do, you know, what do you find to be the most challenging and, and you know, what do you find to be the most rewarding out of wearing all of those hats? Um, the most challenging thing is sound. And I'm still not very good at sound, yeah. you know. I, I I I've been I've improved as I've gone along, and you know I'm always learning. And you know I finally got some new equipment and things like that. So you know I'm getting better at that. But that's frustrating to me just because my brain doesn't work that way. I have a hard time, you know, fathoming something I can't see. I'm a very visual person. So for me, that's sure. the most challenging thing. Um, the most rewarding thing is definitely editing. When I edit a scene and I can watch it come together, especially something that's complicated or an action scene or just a really good meaty dialogue scene, you know, uh, when I've edited it all together and I go back and watch it, you know, that, that to me is the most rewarding thing. Now, with with everything that you've done, you know, in terms of in terms of all those hats, there have been a couple of projects where um, – that you've worked on that – weren't necessarily yours, but but you had parts in. Um, I'm trying to pull it up right now. You did. Uh, come on now. Here we go. You did the special effects for Super Task Force One. Mm-hmm. You did. Hmm, IMDb is wanting to be funny with me right now. <laughs> but um, here we go. Yeah. Be quiet. Windows. Um, yeah, you did the special effects for Super Task Force One. You did the visual effects for three tiers on Bloodstained Flesh. Uh, 
also did digital effects on Babysitter Massacre and Bludgeon. You know, kind of talk about how is it for you when you go onto a set and you're working on a project that is not exclusively your own? Um, I've actually never been on set, so to speak. That's mostly just, you know, they they send me the files to work on because it's all digital effects. And they're like, can you, it always comes down to this. It's just, it's mostly friends and colleagues. And they're like, you know, like, hey, man, this scene looks wrong. Can you add smoke to it? Like, can you make it look like this is happening? Can you put fire here? Can there? Can you do my muzzle flashes and my squibs? Like that's that's usually uh, what it, what it is, you know. And, and like for Super Task Force One, which was one of the biggest effects jobs I ever did, you know, I, I had to do. Um, there were some simple things like laser blasts and explosions and stuff like that, which which I didn't do all of those. Uh, I think the director uh, Steve Radzinski did some of those as well. But I did the big CGI uh, robo robot fight at the end. Which some people uh-huh. criticize as looking super fake, but I kind of, like. <laughs> I think the intention was always for it to look kind of funny, but because um, that's what they were going for with the tone of the film. But um, right, I'm, I mean it, it's fun. It, I like doing that stuff, and I always get to learn a little bit, you know. Um, but when it comes to that stuff, especially because I'm usually not getting paid, or I'm getting paid very little most of the time, not always. I'm just kind of an asshole, and I'm just like, okay, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it, in- <laughs> and I send it back, and there is no, <laughs> there is no lot of back and forth, you know. So now, do you do you enjoy going and working on other people's projects like that? Do you or do you prefer, you know, do you prefer just working on your own, or you know, I mean. You know, it's it's kind of funny because I've you know I've talked to other people in the industry and they're like, you know, you know I'm really more comfortable. I'm in my own skin when I'm working on something that's mine. Yeah, I mean, like honestly, you know, I do, I do music video work, um, DVD authoring, special effects, things like that, and you know, I don't like hate any of it. It's still better than you know going into an office for you know nine hours a day. But I mean, I'll, right. In, you know, at my heart of hearts, I'd rather just be working on, on my stuff all the time. But I don't mind helping people out, and um, I, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I need those those paychecks to pay the rent and stuff like that. Sure. So, you know, it's not, it's not something I hate, but yeah, I, I mean, I'd rather be working on my stuff. Um, let, let's jump back into your films for a minute. Easter Casket. Best villain ever with the puppet Easter Bunny. I, I just I have to I have to say that there's nothing else that you know. Uh, you. That just tripped me the hell out. Again, you know, it 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 got really good. It's got a really good rating on IMDb. It seems like fans really loved it. Uh, you had a, of course you had a great cast for that. You had Aaron Ryan in there. Aaron, I've I've interviewed for Horse Society before. You know, kind of tell us about how you came up with the idea for Easter Casket. Um, again, I was just born out of like, hey, nobody else is doing this. Um, I had watched a couple Easter themed horror movies, and it was always, it's almost always just a guy in a bunny suit, which is just so fucking weird to me that there's like, you know, ten of these movies and they all have the same goddamn idea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm not saying they're all bad or anything, but it's like, Jesus Christ, do something different. So, like, our our kicker was, well, our villain is going to be the actual Easter Bunny. We're going to do it, and he's, and he's literally going to be the Easter Bunny, you know, and which in our movie is played by a puppet. And then from there, it was just like, let's make the most outrageous movie we can with the budget we have, um, which at the time, that was my biggest budget film. We had $5,000 to make Easter Casket, most of which went to, you know, uh, uh paying people for their roles and feeding them in hotel rooms and things like that. But, uh, you know, it, it allowed us to do some cool stuff. And, um, I got to experiment with a lot of, with a lot of ideas that I had. And, uh, that one's really fun. I'm pretty proud of that one. That's one of my favorites, I think. It seems to be a lot of, of, uh, favorite of a lot of fans as well. Now with that one, of course, you had a lot of religious imagery and things like that. Did you ever did you ever get any backlash from anyone uh, uh, about the religious content? No, not at all. No, nobody really said anything. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't know why. I mean, 
the uh, I mean, the movie is pretty. If it's not 100%, it's pretty close to being 100% biblically correct. I did a lot of research, right. um, and a lot of the stuff and conclusions we draw are not so far fetched if you really read the Bible. So, uh, but right. no, nobody, nobody's really ever like come down and, uh, on the movie or you know attacked me or anything because of the content. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, you're right. There, there, to me, there aren't an, enough Halloween movie or Halloween. Easter themed horror films. I mean, the one you know, it's not even really uh, an, an Easter movie, but the one that I always remembered was in Critters, where the where the critter ate through the guy's stomach that was in the Easter Bunny costume in the church. Yeah, you yeah, know, Critters, so it's it's Critters two. Uh, Critters two is like an Easter. It takes place around Easter time. Um, there's right. actually there's there's a really good Easter themed horror movie I like called um, Easter Bunny Kill Kill. Um, so I can't remember the name of the director right now, but that one's actually pretty fun. It's a really, like, sleazy, uh, almost like a slasher-type movie, but I like that one. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'll have to look into that one, but, I mean, I definitely recommend, when people ask me, you know, holiday-themed movies, you know, what do you go for? And, you know, I tell people two of my favorites, of course, are uh, Thanks Killing, if you never saw that, that had the uh, puppet killer turkey. And then I tell yeah. people uh, Easter Casket is the other one that you have to check out. It's just funny that both <laughs> of them happen to be puppet-themed horror films at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, I've touched on, on the special effects and stuff on your film. And, and this next film, and I think I'm right about this, Skinless um, was at one time, wasn't it called The Ballad of Skinless Pete? Yeah. Okay, first of all, why was there a name change? And two, you know, the effects work in that one is is, is absolutely stunning. As an effects artist, I, I looked at that and I was like, holy shit, are you kidding me? It was just, it was absolutely stunning. Can you talk about, you know, how you guys came up with the effects for that film? Because it's it's very realistic in, in a lot of parts. Well, thank you. Um well, the, the title change was just a marketing thing. It got picked up for distribution, and we wanted to give it a simpler title so that it had a better chance uh, with people who weren't underground horror fans. Um, as far as the effects go, uh, that movie was really, really, really low budget. Um, I think we had between $1,500 and two grand to make wow. the movie. And it was just... Um, I just built things out of stuff I had, you know, and uh, most of it was build up uh, effects. There wasn't much, uh, uh, there weren't many molds or anything made. Some of them were repurposed Halloween props, um, a lot of nernies, a lot of uh, fake blood, um, things like that. Uh, the the mask that Skinless Pete himself wears uh, was made by a really um, uh, talented uh, special effects guy named Adam Edwards. Um, he made that for us. Uh, it was silicone. Um, and I did the rest. I painted it, but he, he sculpted it and, and ran it, and then I did the rest of the stuff. And I mean, it was like dummies made out of packing tape covered in nernies and blood. And uh, we did do some, like, limited gelatin prosthetics, which I was really bad at at the time, so we had to cover up how bad they were with massive amounts of blood, <laughs> you know, and, uh, right. and stuff like that. So I, I don't know, a lot of that, you know, I think the lighting and the way we shot it helped it not look utterly awful. But also, I'm not a huge fan of things looking absolutely realistic. I kind of like it when things look a little wonky, and I think the old Full Moon movies have that kind of appeal to them. And I think that, uh, also, I, I always think of the Blob remake, how the gore in that movie is really, really, it's really violent, really gory, but none of it looks exactly real. It almost looks like, the expressionistic representation of gore, and I kind of prefer that look to absolutely, ana you know, stuff being absolutely anatomically correct. Now, your next project was th Theater of the Deranged too, and that's kind of like an anthology-style uh, film, and you were, uh, Plate Face, I believe, was the name of the segment that you did. Kind of yeah. tell us about how you got involved with Theater of the Deranged, and did you actually write the piece, Plate Face, or was that something that they wanted you to do? Um, that was, I, I, if I remember correctly, I was just approached by um, James Bressack about it. 
and um, he's come together with a couple other filmmakers. Um, one of them was Shane Ryan. I can't remember who all is in. I know James has a short in it. Uh, and yeah, I uh, came up with the concept for uh, Plate Face, a.k.a. Three Apples. It's also called Three Apples. And um, uh, it's actually the, like, that short is the prototype for Apple Cart, uh, you know, which is uh, coming out next month. But um, that's kind of how that went down. I did write it and kind of made it independently and actually produced it myself and stuff like that. And then um, he added it to the compilation. And I think Troma has the rights now, but I have no idea if and when it's ever coming out. So. Huh. Now, after that, you did another film that, that seemed to get a, a lot of critical response, and that was Kill the Bitch. And um, you had uh, Countess Bathory in that. I, I do know I do know her, and, of course, Aaron's in it again, and, you know, you got Brandon in there. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of tell us about how the concept for, for that film came out. Um, that one, it kept being like – I always had that title – and the twist was the same, and a lot of the content was similar, and the theme was similar. But it changed like about ten times before I actually came out with that script. And for whatever reason, the form that it's in is just the way it came out when I wrote it. You know, so it's like you know, it's it's always hard to describe to people. You know, it's kind of like a slasher movie. It kind of it kind of goes like three or four different directions, and most of the time, people are sort of you know, shocked um, and sometimes pissed off when they get to the end and they kind of see what was actually going on. Um, so I, that one was just, you know, I wanted to tell a weird story and um, I wanted to play around with, you know, being very visual. You know, it, there's a lot of, there's actually probably not as much dialogue in that. It was a shorter script than a lot of my other scripts and I wanted to see what I could do with, you know, using visuals and uh, it was lit lit in an interesting way. The cinematography, uh, we didn't use a lot of lights. It was shot with a lot of available light, um, you know, light that, lights that were actually in the scene, sunlight coming through windows, things like that. So, it, right. again, it was a big experiment and kind of a story I wanted to tell. And that one, Kill That Bitch is actually my favorite movie I've made so far. I'm really, really proud of that one. I really like that one. So. Now, with that one and the next film we're going to talk about, her, her name was Torment. Um, as a side note, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, I've seen a few places online where people have commented about your films and things like that. And the term that comes up every now and now and again is is that phrase that seems to be dreaded by some and loved by others, and, and that's the title of torture porn. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, what are your thoughts on on people commenting on your films being quote unquote that style? And you know, because to me, while I would say you have elements of that, I would certainly say that your films are more of a grindhouse style, in, in my opinion. But you know, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I, when it really comes down to it, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, like all those labels. Um, whatever people need to use it to describe it to other people, I guess it's fine. I mean, I don't, I don't set out to make any particular thing most of the time. I just kind of make the movie and, you know, it is what it is. And I let it grow on its own and have its own identity. So, um, I mean, if, you know, if people call, I don't know about, um, kill that bitch. I think that one plays more like a slasher for the most part, but I mean, if you want to call her name was Torment a torture porn, I mean, I can't really disagree because it has a lot of the hallmarks of that. Um, I also think it has a lot more going on than a lot of those movies in that genre, subgenre do, but, I mean, I can't really, you know, I can't really deny it. But, right. Um, the, the title I kind of dislike more than that is when people call me an extreme filmmaker, which I don't know if I really dislike it, I guess. I just don't really think I am one, <laughs> you know? And I think when right. you slap the stream on something, it creates a lot of expectations. And, uh, and I mean, if we're being honest, I mean, what the fuck does that really even mean anyway to say something that it, you know, something is an extreme film, you know, it's kind of, sure. it's, that's your label. Now, on, on while we're talking about Her Name Was Torment, you know, that, that certainly has a lot of interesting elements to it. You know, you could you could certainly draw to a degree, parallels to Hard Candy and movies like that. 
what was you know when you when you came up with the idea for her name was torment you know where did that story idea come up and you know the the visual style that you used for that film I, I think is very fascinating kind of talk about why you went in the direction you did with the visual style for that particular film um her name was torment it was interesting it was born out of i i literally was just like you know i'm going to make a movie about this naked woman taking this guy apart and that, and see if I can build and like a movie around it and a narrative around it and a universe around it, and that's kind of what that was. And so it started out as very, you know, literally just that. And then, you know, as I went, it was very free form. We didn't really have a script. We had an outline, and we kind of collectively threw ideas in and kept coming up with stuff. And um, you know, it just turned into her name was Torment. Um, the visual style. It was just all experimental, you know. I was kind of, you know, I, I have a rhyme and reason to some of the visuals why they look the way they do and why certain things are presented a certain way that I don't want to really give away. But you know, it sure. was a lot of, it was a lot of, well, this worked, you know. I'm going to try this and see if it works, and you know, going from there. Now you're you're you just did a a crowdfund not that long ago for a sequel to Her Name Was Torment. Is that not correct? Right, a, a sequel. Uh, two sequels, part two and part three. You know, were you kind of looking to to take the sequels from the first one? And, you know, are are you looking to go – I know you just said you hated the word, but I feel like with this, it, it kind of applies. You know, are you looking to go in a, you know – more extreme because you know her name was torment was definitely one of those films that you you kind of sit back and, and you're like ooh I tell you what it reminded me of to be perfectly honest with you I'm a big fan of um, Unearth Films and Stephen Biro down in uh, down in Florida and they had mm-hmm. put out the Guinea Pig box set and mm-hmm. in a lot of ways her name is torment reminds me a lot of the Devil's Experiment if you're familiar with that one it's basically two guys who who have this woman captive, and they just do varying degrees of torture to her un- until she dies. Is of course, the, is this the first one, or I've I've seen those movies, but it's been since high school, and I don't know that I've seen all of them. But I mean, I can see I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, it was, it was the first one. It was the one that uh, Martin Sheen had investigated by the FBI because he thought it was actually a snuff film. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen that a long time ago. I saw that. Yeah. You know, and, no, I and I mean that as a compliment. That's that's ex- and when I sat there and I watched it, I was like, "Holy shit! This is this is some crazy stuff." The, yeah, the um the sequels do get crazier. Uh, two is the second one is 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 has a higher body count is goes way weirder places. Um, they just they, you know they're just they're very much both sequels will be very much like the first film just a little bit bigger and a little bit crazier and, and as we go we'll reveal more and more information about what is going on. But I don't even know if by the end of it anyone will completely understand everything that happened, but we will, you know, reveal uh story elements and, and things like that as we go. Now another now I have not had a chance to see this one, but I did watch the trailer. Snuff it to me just looks like it's gonna be a lot of fun to watch, you know, uh, (laughs) again, puppets, you know, but, but kind of talk about, was the idea more passable, easier to do because it was puppets? Would you, would you have a harder time doing a film like that if it was actual people? Yeah, but just because it'd be boring because, (laughs) (laughs) because it's been done so, so much before, you know what I mean? Uh, it, for me, the you know it was fun to do it this way just because you know I hadn't I hadn't really seen it done, and uh, it, it produced its own you know its own challenges and stuff like that. Uh, you know, hiding puppeteers and strings and things like that, and the scene setups. It was one of the first movies we where we were shooting multiple cameras at a time, and uh, stuff like that. So it was you know, all these movies, especially you know starting with her name was Torment. I started this offshoot label called Crumple Shack, which is kind of our grindhouse type stuff. It's, you know, we shoot them quick and dirty, and they're nasty, and they're weird, and uh, Snuff It was the second of those, and um, it was just an experiment. It was just, hey, let's 
do this and see if it works. Let's tell this story and see if anybody gives a shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, well, and, you know, and the movie that that I draw a parallel to it with, and of course, like I said, I haven't seen Snuff at all the way. I haven't seen it, but I saw the trailer. It kind of, from a visual style and kind of what I can see from the trailer, it reminds me of uh, of an obscure title called Psychos in Love. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but it no, seems like the dynamic. What's that? No, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, and, and I mean, like I said, it's 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 definitely meant as a compliment. It's it's one of those really rare obscure films, and it, it seems like the dynamic between, you know, the male and female character in the film seems very, you know, along those lines. So I, I'm really looking forward to to getting my hands on a copy of Snuff It. Now the uh, the other one I haven't seen either is The Hornet Sting and the Hell It Caused. Tell us a little bit about that film. Um, that one is kind of my attempt at making. A God, it's hard. It's hard to describe. It's very, it's very sleazy. Um, I wanted to take a very, very sleazy, nasty, dirty concept and shoot it in an artful way um, to see if, like, can you know, can you add beauty to something that's grotesque? Because it goes really weird, fucking gross places. Um, I'm really proud of it. I think it's one of my better movies. Because we made it and kind of released it without telling anybody, we didn't do a lot of lead-up uh, promotion or anything because I, I, I wanted to surprise people with it. I don't think many people have seen it, um, but it's, uh, I don't know, I think it's worth watching, but you kind of do have to be ready to have your stomach turn a little bit or, or feel a little weird about yourself <laughs> when you're watching it because it's, it's very mean and, and it doesn't really pull very many punches. Now, of course, we mentioned Apple Cart. Tell us a little yeah. bit about Apple Cart. Because um, I saw Apple where, um, who was, I'm trying to remember, uh, Rob Dimension, I believe it was, had mentioned that you had sent him a, a little bit of teaser stuff to look at. And I, I've had Rob on the show, and I think he's a great guy, too. Yeah, I like Rob quite a bit. Um, yeah, Apple Cart was born from, you know, we did that short for, uh, theater of the Deranged, and I like the style so much that I kind of wanted to play around with that a little more. Um, so Apple Card is black and white, it's silent, and everyone in the movie wears masks, so it almost has a like weird kabuki theater type element to it. And the entire premise is that I personally have a, a real and actual fear of um, people who seem normal, quote unquote, uh, people who whose families don't seem to be dysfunctional, people who are a little too wholesome. Um, right. Because I always, I always feel like they're liars. I always feel like they're hiding something. And I sort of believe that as human beings, we're kind of all weird, curious, obsessed perverts. And it's better. <laughs> it's most of the time, you know, unless unless your perversions are harmful. It's better most of the time to to be open about them and talk about them and, uh, well, even then you should talk about them. I mean, if you have, especially if you have harmful ones, you should talk about it. And, uh, get it out of your system or get yourself help because if you don't, it festers and it gets worse and it gets worse and eventually it's going to come out. And Apple Card is kind of about that. It's an anthology film of several different stories, different families, different peoples, uh, or different peoples, different people, um, couples who all are seemingly normal. Um, it could be anybody, and then you see, you know, the the perversion or the strangeness or the violence that is, you know, that's hidden. Um, super experimental, very, very, very explicit and graphic, and um, it'll be interesting to see what people think of it. Um, everybody who I've shown the five minute preview to, I think, um, I think they've all been pretty impressed with it. Um, and uh, the response so far has been really good. So we'll we'll see what happens when it gets released. Now, one of the things, um, I, when I told a, a buddy of mine that I was going to have you on, and, and he was looking at um, he was looking at your at your IMDb, and he's like, you know, how in the hell has this guy put so many projects out in such a short time? And, and I think that's actually a, a great question. You know, like I said, the quality of your films, you know, every film, it just it seems like it gets better and better and better and better. And the detail is better. And the quality is better. The dialogue, just everything about it. How in the blue hell 
are you putting out so many projects <laughs> at one time? Do you sleep? Uh-huh. Do you eat? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's a compliment to you as <laughs> as for what you do. I mean, I'm, it's just amazing that you have gotten these projects out, and they're all just such great quality for the budgets you know, that you're doing to kind of tell us about how, how in the hell are you doing this? I don't know because it doesn't seem weird to me. It doesn't seem out of the ordinary that I would, that I would put out that much work because that's just what I do. It's my job. Um, I, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I was lucky enough a couple of years ago that, you know, uh, I got the opportunity to quit my day job and do this full time. Um, and by that, I don't mean I have a sugar mama, <laughs> <laughs> my wife, and, my wife and wife's and my relationship doesn't really work that way. It's it's a it's an equal fifty fifty type thing. Uh, but you know, I just sort of work things out to the point where it's like, okay, I can have relatively reliable, steady income here. Um, and so this now full time, I make movies. Outside of that, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you because, like I said, it just doesn't seem weird to me. It just seems like. It just seems like what I should be doing. You know, I finish a movie, and I get it out there for people to see it so my fans can get it, and then I do another one. And I know for other people, like, it makes sense to, like, go to festival and to hunt down and, you know, and, and battle it out with distributors. And uh, and I have distributed a few movies, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that uh, and stuff like that. But for me, I just I want to get it out there, let people see it, get it in as many places as I can, and then move on to the next project to keep my sanity. So now that's mentioning that, mentioning that, I wanted to ask you. You know, if people want to get copies of your films, you know, are they available on Blu-ray? Are they available on DVD? Do you watch them on download? You know, kind of kind of tell people where they can find your product. Um, if you search Dustin Mills on Amazon, uh, pre- most of my filmography is up there. Um, you can pre-order stuff and get Blu-rays and. All that stuff from my web my uh, web store, which is uh, uh, dmp dot store dot com. So D as in dog, M as in mom, uh, P as in uh, potato. <laughs> dot store envy s t o r e n v y dot com, um, and pretty much everything is also there. Um, T L A uh, cult has a bunch of my stuff, so. I mean, if you search my name or if you search the title of a movie, you should be able to find it fairly easy. Yeah, and definitely, you know, for for, for the fans listening, of course, you can see the trailers for just about all of D- uh, Dustin's work right there on um, on YouTube as well. And, of course, you have your YouTube page and you kind of have some behind-the-scenes stuff and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, now, we have about seven minutes left, so there's a few more things I wanted to hit on. Um, one of them is, is you know, you put out such such amazing work, you know, and you, you can you can argue the semantics of, you know, is it horror, is it is it exploitation, is it thriller, is it this, is it that, you know. But aside from that, when you sit down and you want to be entertained, you know, what films do you watch? What directors, you know, catch your eye? Um, <clears throat> I love uh, pretty much everything that that uh, Guillermo del Toro does. Um, he's probably my favorite director. Um, there, I mean, there are a few directors that I keep an eye on, but for the most part, it's just movie to movie. You know, I mean, uh, I like some of the superhero movies that come out. You know, I love Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, I love kids movies like How to Train Your Dragon one and two are two of my favorite movies. The Incredibles by Pixar are my favorite movies. I don't, like, when I was younger, I watched tons of horror. But nowadays, uh, you know, the horror flicks I'll actually watch are kind of few and far between. I think I think when I used to watch them, it was a catharsis that is now filled by making them. So I don't have the urge to watch them as much anymore. But I do enjoy a good horror movie. But I'm like a horror, you know, hardcore horror fan force nightmare because the stuff I like is like, I like Paranormal Activity 1 and 2. I like The Conjuring. I like Oculus. You know, I like the, the ghost movies and the paranormal movies. I'm not huge into slashers. I'm not huge into zombie movies. I like old zombie movies, but newer ones, not so much. Um, so I don't know. My tastes are really eclectic, and 
I used to think I was a horror fan, and I would describe myself that way. And then I met real horror fans, and I'm like, I those guys know way more about horror movies than I do, you know. So <laughs> I'm I'm a movie fan. I like escapism. I like fight scenes and special effects and and stuff like that, you know. So I I don't know. I like a little bit of everything. Oh, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. And 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 as far as you're like, you know, real horror fan, you are a real horror fan. You couldn't be a horror fan and not do what you do. It's just a matter of semantics and and degrees. And you know, yeah. I, I had asked you about did you did you get any lashback from you know Easter casket for religion? You know, her name is torment for you know for the torture. And, and but you know, and again, I hate to use the word that you don't like, but it it, it fits this question. A lot of your content would be considered extreme. Is there a line as a filmmaker that you would not cross? Um, I wouldn't. I mean, I won't break the law. Uh, I won't hurt anybody right. for real. Um, but other than that, it's, it it really comes down to the comfort level of my actors. Uh, I don't perceive a line as far as just content goes, as long as it's you know it's. It, pretend um i mean we go pretty far sometimes you know uh i don't think i've gone as far as like someone like mary and dora or you know like lucifer valentine or uh maybe even fred vogel i don't think i've ever gone as far as those guys go but uh you know that's uh just because i hadn't had any interest to yet doesn't mean i never will i guess Um, sure so there i don't i mean i really i don't get offended really by anything except for like rudeness <laughs> so sure uh uh i don't know i don't really perceive a line you know as long as it serves the story um you know i i don't know that's that's an interesting question but i i don't know i right now at this juncture i don't really have a cutoff point that i can think of in my mind now i always ask this of, of directors and all of your work has been original work but as a filmmaker, and you don't have to limit this to the horror genre, but you know, if you had the opportunity and the budget to remake any film out there, what would that film be? Man, there there are a couple, and there's a couple. Um, there are a couple uh, franchises that I would like to adapt. I feel like the answer to that question used to be Puppet Master. But just because I have a really strong innate desire to fix that series, because I used to like it so much, and now I fucking hate it. Uh, but uh, right now, the answer is the Giver, like a live action version of the Giver, because right. it is just a really bloody movie about monsters fighting other monsters, and that fucking excites me to no end. <laughs> you know, it's like that's my geek gasm is monsters and creatures and. Uh, and them fighting, you know, oftentimes with kung fu and martial arts, and uh, I'm totally down for that. So if I could remake something, I'd probably remake the Giver, especially since you can't even get the original Giver with the blood and gore intact anymore unless you have the VHS. You know, every other version of it is cut. So That's very true. That is that is absolutely true. But that, that's you really know, in my wheelhouse. No, I, I feel you on that, and you know it's it's that's that's interesting that that you would pick that title. I mean, I I would definitely buy it. I would watch it. So, if anyone out there is listening, and you're looking for an independent filmmaker who knows what he's doing, this is Dustin's the guy you you guys need to talk to. So, you know, maybe maybe I'll find my way up there, and maybe I can I can come work on something with you because you you know like I said, it's I I talk to a lot of independent film people. I talk to a lot of independent directors and actors and stuff, and. And I love everyone's work that I've had on, but like I said, there's there's just something about your visual style and the way that you do things that that really intrigues me as an effects artist. I would I would really find it fascinating to try and work with you on something. So maybe one Thank day you. in the future, you and I will run into one another and and we can make some history doing something. Yeah, that'd be cool. Now. For everyone that's listening, of course, you know, I know you have your fans tuning in and listening, but for those of you that are new to your work, you know, if they want to follow you, you know, do you have a web page, Facebook, Twitter, anything like that that you want the people to know they can get in contact with you and, and, and see what you're all about? Um, yeah, I'm I'm at Puppet Massacre on Twitter. 
I'm Dustin Wade Mills, and Wade is spelled W-A-Y-D-E. Dustin Wade Mills on Facebook. Um, my store envy page is out there. Um, like I said, pretty much if you search my name, if you search the name of any of the movies, they're pretty easy to find. I, I do a fairly decent job of getting them out there and making sure they're easy to find online and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, friend me. Uh, add me on Twitter. Uh, find me on Instagram. I can't remember my Instagram name right now. Because uh, uh, I'm new to that. I just now have a smartphone after years and years and years. I just got one like a couple months ago. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, find me and friend me. And um, I'm a shameless self-promoter, so you'll be hearing about my <laughs> my projects the moment you friend me. So. Now, of course, we know Apple Cart, and we know her name is Torment 2 and, and 3. Is there anything else we should be watching out for uh, coming from you anytime soon? At the end of the month, I'm releasing a, a, a very uh, limited DVD uh, called the DMP Collection, which is um, it's a collection of shorts, music videos, things I've done, things that most people have never seen, stuff I did in high school with my friends, uh, stuff like that on there, and lots of shorts that I've made and uh, a couple new shorts and and stuff like that. So that's coming out at the end of the month. Then the next month is Apple Cart. After that, um, you know, we'll be deep working, deep into production on Her Name Was Torment 2 and 3. Um, but there will probably be some, you know, little experimental films and things like that that come out in the meantime. So I don't know. I, I you know, I'm always, I always have something coming out almost every month or every other month. So just keep your eyes peeled and your ears open, and I'm sure I'll let everybody know what I'm doing. Well, definitely. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to get my hands on, on some of your films here. I would love to uh, do a few write-ups. I know Mac has covered most of your stuff on Horror Society, but I would love to add some of your projects to my digital dismemberment line of reviews. And I'd love to get your name into uh, Living Dead Magazine, who I write for as well. I'm, I'm starting to do more DVD and film review for them, so I would love to get you in cool. print. I would appreciate that. Oh, it, no problem at all, man. So be looking for an order from me sometime soon. Trust me. <laughs> awesome. But, you know, Dustin, thank you so much for coming on. You're always welcome. I, I love your independent flair and style. I love how you handle things. I think you were an absolutely fantastic interview. And like I said, I know oh, Mac you. usually gets most of your info up, but if you ever have any news you need put out there, feel free to send me a message, man, and I'll get you up there as well. All right. Thank you very much. Anytime, man. Thank you for coming on. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, that was the absolutely amazing independent microfilm maker, director, writer, and producer, Dustin Wade Mills. Make sure to keep an eye out for Apple Cart, which will be coming up, and Her Name is Torment 2 and 3. Besides that, make sure to get yourself copies of Her Name was Torment, Kill That Bitch, Easter Casket, Bath Salt Zombies, and the Puppet let me make sure I get the name right on that one. I'm going to feel like a real dick if I get that one wrong. Puppet Monster Massacre. So go check out Dustin on all formats of social media and make friends with this guy. I'm telling you, sooner or later, he's going to wind up doing something, and all of you are going to be going, oh, I didn't know about the guy. Yeah, you did, because I said something about him here tonight. So keep an eye out for him. Coming up in a few minutes, we're going to have our second digital dismemberment spotlight, and we are going to be talking about Scream Factories, The Doctor, and The Devils. But before that, it is time for our last double shot of Metal Blade music. We're going to open this set up with Cattle Decapitation from their CD, Monolith of Inhumanity. The song is Kingdom of Tyrants.
From their CD, Monolith of Inhumanity, the song was Kingdom of Tyrants. Before we get into our digital dismemberment, I have a couple of things I want to talk about. First of all, make sure to check, go over to livingdeadmagazine.com. We are taking pre-orders for the new issue, which is a Rob Zombie special. In particular, in that episode or in that issue. I do a DVD review of Death by VHS by Scarlet Fry. I also interview the one and the only Bill Mosley, who, of course, was Otis Driftwood in House of a Thousand Corpses and The Devil's Rejects. And I also do a retrospective on those two films. So make sure to check that out. Um, I also wanted to give a shout-out to... Horror Society and The Calling Hours friend, Max Wassa. For those of you that don't remember, Max was on uh, a couple of months ago, and Max is not doing so well with health issues. If you head on over to HorrorSociety.com, I have a post on there about how we can help Max out, because Max is really one of the good people out there, and uh, we should all look out for our own, and Max is definitely one of our own. But now, once again, it is time for some digital dismemberment. Digital dismemberment. And in our second digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening, we are going to be talking about Scream Factory's The Doctor and the Devils. A man of medicine 
a pair of murderers, an unholy alliance. Scream Factory has announced a November 14th Blu-ray release of the murderous thriller, The Doctor and the Devils. Directed by Freddie Francis, executive produced by Mel Brooks, and based on Dylan Thomas's original screenplay, this shocking horror thriller star- stars Timothy Dalton as Thomas Rock, a brilliant young anatomy professor in 1820s Edinburgh. At first, accepting only the cadavers provided him for study, those of a few hanged criminals per year, Rock eventually recruits two grave robbers, played by Jonathan Price and Stephen Ray, to secure a better supply of corpses. Coming to the gory conclusion that they will earn more the fresher the corpses, the two begin committing murders and delivering warm bodies to the doctor's lecture chambers. Also starring Julian Sands, Patrick Stewart, and Twiggy, The Doctors and the Devils brings classic chills from start to finish. Uh, Special features on this disc include commentary with author and film historian Steve Haberman, and there's a new interview with executive producer Mel Brooks, producer Jonathan Sanger, and former Brooks Films Development executive Randy Auerbach. Of course, you have the theatrical trailer on that as well. You know, this is a movie that I can say in a roundabout way, thanks to my mother, I enjoyed. My mother has always been a uh, a fan of period films, and The Doctor and the Devil certainly fits that. Um, You know, I, I found it to be It's very engaging, both in terms of the characters and in terms of of the story itself. You know, when when you look at, I mean, you've got Timothy Dalton and and Patrick Stewart playing foils of each other, and and I found that extremely extremely interesting. You know, back in those times, anatomy people who studied anatomy, you know, there were rules about what you could do to the bodies, because in in particular in the film, there's this one scene where they talk about um, they that they couldn't do certain things to the bodies, the bodies had to be whole so that they could go their souls could go to heaven, and and Timothy Dalton's character is very passionate about what he is doing, and and it's, and the important thing to remember is, is his character is not telling these guys to go out and kill people, these guys take it upon themselves to kill people and bring the fresh bodies back to Timothy Dalton's character. Of course, you have Julian Sands as his apprentice, and, you know, I think his role in the film is quite nice as well. In fact, it all ties in rather well with, um, he helps a young prostitute's brother who was hit by a wagon, he and uh, Timothy Dalton's character... Uh, fix the, the gentleman's leg, and later on, um, he winds up dead, and the guy's sister also winds up dead at the hands of these gentlemen, and, you know, you, you get the you get the idea of the poverty skid row type, you know, these guys are doing everything they can to make money, and even though one of them kind of develops a conscience towards the end, he still meets his fate at the hands of the hangman's noose. One of the things I found extremely interesting about the film is the fact that Mel Brooks produced it. Normally when you think of Mel Brooks, you think of comedies and and things like this, and this is certainly not a comedy. While it's not an all-out gore fest, um, you know, there are violent moments to to the film. And of course, you know, you're talking about anatomy, so, you know, you kind of have things here and there. You know, an interesting side story about how the doctor's career is, is basically ruined, not only because of you know, him paying these people, but because of the work that he does, uh, his wife, uh, much to the chagrin of his sister, of, of, uh, Thomas Rock, Timothy Dalton's character's sister, um, you know, he's doing anatomy drawings, and of course there's the tension between all of that. The film looks absolutely stunning and beautiful on Blu-ray, the transfer is amazing, the quality of the sound in the picture, of course, is high up there with Screen Factory's other titles. Um, I would certainly give this film uh, a three and a half uh, out of five stars. It's it's just different. There's there, I really don't know how else to put it. It's it definitely fits our genre, but not in the in, in the same way that that many would think of a of a slasher or or things along those lines. Beautifully acted, like I said, superb superb cast. Um, 
detail, uh, special attention to detail to um, the housing, the locations, the clothing. The accents are even really good in this film. And, and of course, it's always a joy to see Patrick Stewart in anything. It, it was really uh, cool to see him to play the head of the medical board and his arguments with Timothy Dalton's character about what he's doing and how he's doing it. So again, I would give this about a three and a half star rating as far as special features and everything goes. The interview with Mel Brooks is absolutely stunning, and it's it's kind of amazing that he just he looks so old in this, um, even though it's a, a recent interview. But it's it's really interesting to hear about how the concept came about, distribution, and and how they took his name off of the film because people were expecting comedies and the sort from him. So as far as the special features and everything go, I would give this I would give this disc about a seven out of ten. Again, it's well worth picking up. This is a good film to uh, to fill in a hole in, in in your collection. And if you're looking for something I said again that's more period piece related, <coughs> I would definitely recommend this film. Head on over to Shout Factory and Screen Factory to order your copy. You should be able to get it from Amazon.com. Uh, if you're lucky, your local big box retailer will carry the film as well. Well, I, I think it's been an absolutely stunning night. I want to say thank you so much to our guest this evening, director, writer, and producer Dustin Wade Mills, telling us about Apple Cart, and her name was Torment, Kill That Bitch, Easter Casket, Bath Salt Zombies, and more. Keep an eye on this guy. I'm telling you, he's a name that people are going to be talking about years from now. So check out his work. I want to say thank you to Scream Factory for sending us our copies of the Vincent Price Collection 2 and The Doctor and the Devils. Also want to say thank you to our friends at Metal Blade Record for sending us such great metal to listen to. It's been a great week, ladies and gentlemen, and next week will be another awesome show. Make sure to tune in at the same time, and until then, rest in peace.